All right, today we're going to talk about uh, logical fallacies and uh, how to actually reason appropriately from the scripture, but also um, I'm going to emphasize how we discuss biblical interpretation with one another without uh, basically being immoral toward one another, without sinning against one another. Um, now, I, I commented last time that logical using a logical fallacy is a moral issue. And so people think that like uh, pointing out a logical error is often like pointing out a grammatical mistake, like you're just being nitpicky. But in reality, pointing out a logical error means your entire argument fails. You're, you're not making an argument toward the actual issue. It's just smoke and mirrors. You're not actually um, establishing a point, and you're not actually refuting anything. In reality, what you're doing is you're wasting your time, and you're wasting the time of the person, and we're all wasting God's time that has been given to us to actually understand the truth and to develop our minds in thinking like Christ, to be thinking biblically. And so you want to make sure that when you engage in conversations or when you engage in biblical interpretation, you are coming at it from a logical standpoint. Now, why? Why is that? We often act like logic is something secular. Logic is not a secular thing. It is not some academic uh, so sort of enterprise. Instead, it is from the very nature of God. God is reason within himself. He is the word. Uh, he is logical. Uh, the law of non-contradiction comes from God's nature. God can't contradict himself. He cannot both be truth and also lie at the same time. He can only be truth. And so we understand that when he thinks or speaks truth, that whatever truth he speaks, the opposite is not also true. Um, because whatever he has said, he's then refuting anything that contradicts that truth. Now, um, I'm going to go through a, a few logical fallacies and then kind of just give some examples either in biblical interpretation and how things uh, are applied to the Bible in a wrong way. But I want to emphasize more how we discuss our biblical interpretations with one another, how we do theology and ethics with one another, because, I mean, that's where I think the modern church has failed. Uh, I think that most people... Because in our culture, people are not taught to reason logically. Instead, they are taught to reason emotionally. They are taught to reason by what they like and don't like. Because again, going back to the first lesson, we think biblical interpretation and theology and ethics are all subjective. We have been taught that from an atheistic, agnostic, deistic, post-modernity. Uh, this this postmodern idea that ultimately uh, everything that we say, everything we believe and do, it's really just built on our own personal experience and what we think. And there's no way to really tell what's really true and what's really right and what's really wrong. And so that comes into evangelicalism to where, well, no one, we, the Bible might be right, but no one really knows what it says. Um, and so your guess is as good as mine, and there's nothing objective to really find the truth of the Bible. And what we really have done there is we've, we've gagged God in that way. Uh, we've not allowed God to speak, because if it's impossible to actually communicate logically to where we can figure it out by using reason, by using laws of linguistics that... The language is built upon, which are nothing more than logical laws on how we communicate, which, by the way, is also what we assume when we communicate to one another. We're constantly using logic when we communicate to one another. If we do that, we ultimately are saying that God cannot communicate to us. God has failed to communicate accurately and sufficiently to us because no one can understand objectively what he's saying. And so it's all a free for all. Uh, God's word is just nothing but some abstract ink blot, and we're all just putting our own preconceptions on it, and no one can figure out what it's saying. That's what we're doing when we're saying there's nothing objective about Scripture. We're all just subjectively interpreting it. And so it's very important to not think, well, my opinion is as good as anybody else's opinion, even though I'm not as studied in this area. I don't know Greek. I don't know Hebrew. I don't know any of that, but it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, 
Uh, my opinion's just as good as any. Now, this comes to our first logical fallacy. This is why I brought this up. Um, this particular logical fallacy is what some people have called maybe an appeal to trauma. Uh, I would simply say it's, it's kind of part of a, a, a fallacy that is an appeal to experience. And, and what it essentially means is that uh, someone, let's say, goes through a traumatic experience like, a, you know, divorce or something or whatever. And now they're an expert on divorce. So let's say, let's say for instance, you know, my parents are divorced and remarried. Now I'm an expert on divorce and remarriage. I, I have some sort of keen insight because I've lived this experience that, you know, I should write a book about divorce and remarriage. Even though I may not know what the Bible says about it, if, if I, I'm not really a scholar in those areas, somehow I know something about it because I've been through this experience. Well, in the same way, and you have people do this with like, you know, uh, well, you know, my mom's a nurse, therefore I know a lot about medicine. It's like, well, not really. I mean, uh, it's like saying your dad's a pilot and therefore you know how to fly a plane. It's like, it, that doesn't really follow. It's a, what we'll discuss as a non sequitur. But um, ultimately, what we do in Christianity is this very fallacy. We say to ourselves, I'm a Christian, therefore I know the Bible. I'm a Christian, therefore I have a special relationship with God and I know what God thinks, and I know what the Bible says, and I'm able to interpret the Bible now because I'm a Christian. As though you becoming a Christian somehow gives you via osmosis some sort of insight into the scripture that you didn't have before. In reality, because the scripture is written in language, human language, you have to study human language in order to understand it. Um, the only reason this illusion persists is because we have English translations. If I handed you, again, like I did in the original study, if I handed you a Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek Bible and said, okay, you become a Christian now, read that for me. Tell me what it says. You would not be able to do it because it doesn't give you any insight whatsoever on what the Bible says simply because you become a Christian. Now, the Spirit of God may make you more teachable. In fact, I wouldn't even say may. He absolutely will make you more teachable to the Word of God. You have been given a new man. You've been given the mind of Christ to where you can receive the things of Christ now. But that doesn't mean you're going to be able to interpret the Bible. You're simply prepared now to receive the things of Christ as God communicates them through the men who are interpreting the Bible, the elders of the church. And so, uh, yes, if you study really hard and you learn Hebrew and you learn Aramaic and you learn Greek and you learn all the stuff we talked about in terms of language, then sure, yeah, then you'd be able to interpret the Bible more. But that's not because you became a Christian. And so I almost feel there's this over-realized eschatology to where the noetic effects of the fall, those are the, the effects of the fall on your mind, are somehow gone once you become a Christian. Um, the noetic effects are still there just as well as your flesh is still there. You are not one person with one nature. You have a fallen nature as well. And that fallen nature is violent toward the things of God. It doesn't accept the things of God. It hates God still. You may love God in your new man, but in the old man, you don't love God. And so in no way do you want to learn the truth. And it distorts the truth even when you hear it. But the idea that somehow the new man by himself, apart from the church, apart from men who have studied, um, somehow knows the Bible automatically is nonsense. There, there's, there's no way, and it's proven by my just handing you this book right here and saying, okay, well, go ahead. You go ahead and read it for me then. What does that say? And so, uh, yeah, you don't know the Bible just because you're a Christian. You don't know the truth just because you're a Christian. It doesn't give you any sort of special status above even an unbeliever in understanding theology, ethics, the Bible, or anything else other than the Spirit of God saying yes when you hear something and no when you don't. And even then you have to be careful because is it, is it the Spirit of God saying that or your flesh? So you still have to be careful and you, you need to use the objective reasoning and arguments from the word of God that uses language and the logic thereof to communicate truth. 
So uh, none of this uh, argument from trauma, argument from uh, special circumstance or any of that uh, argument from experience that because I'm a Christian, therefore I already know what the Bible says. It's, it's you know, as though it's written to me as a Christian or something. Now, similar to these fallacies are fallacies like appeals to emotion or appeals to offense. And so when we often communicate truths to one another, especially if they're truths that we don't like, um, we're suddenly going to argue in ways that are um, emotional. And so we're going to say things like, uh, you know what, that offends me. That, that's really offensive. Have you ever had someone like come back at an argument you give them and, and their whole argument is just, that's really, you're going to offend a lot of people with that. And they're actually saying you shouldn't make that argument because you're going to offend people. Um, this is, this is probably a really common argument in this day, right? Like, well, you know, that's, uh, you're, you're offending people by, by saying that, you know, there are only two genders or, you know, whatever. It's very common in our culture to argue this way that because you offend people, suddenly that must mean that your argument's wrong. Because if your argument was right, it wouldn't offend people. Um, likewise, an appeal to emotion is something like, uh, well, you, you're arguing against transgenderism, but you know that transgenders, they commit suicide because people like you argue against them. That's the fallacy of it appealing to emotion. You're, you're not actually dealing with the argument whether transgenderism is true. You're actually just saying, you're a bad person, for doing this, for even saying what might be true, for even making an argument. And so it becomes an ad hominem as well that we'll talk about next. Um, you're a bad person because ultimately people are committing suicide and, uh, and they're doing it because of people like you who say that homosexuality is wrong, that say that transgenderism is wrong. You, you know, no one would make that argument if we were talking about pedophiles. No one would make the argument. You know, most most murderers, when you, they go on like gun sprees, they, they turn the gun on themselves and kill themselves. Um, no one makes the argument, you know what, How the police should have never gone after that guy. No one should say that that guy is doing wrong because look at how many people kill themselves just because they murdered a bunch of people. Stop saying that murder is wrong. Um, look at all the pedophiles that are suicidal. Stop saying that pedophilia is wrong. You're pushing them into suicide. Nobody makes that argument because they realize whether people commit suicide or not, whether it's related or not, evil needs to be called out when it's evil. And so we need to discuss what is evil. Where am I getting this standard? Am I just making it up? So from the scripture arguing, hey, uh, this is wrong scripturally. And therefore people need to stop doing it. And the argument against that is not, well, you know, people kill themselves if you make that argument, so don't make it. That has nothing to do with the argument. The argument still stands, that it may be actually completely evil, but you've done nothing to actually throw it down by saying, oh, well, uh, uh, people are, are harmed by this argument or something in some way. So going on to the next argument is the argument of ad hominem. I want to sit here for a little bit. I'm not going to go through every logical fallacy. You can look them up, up online. There are YouTube videos that you can look at. Uh, but I want to deal with ones that we specifically deal with often uh, in Christianity, in the church. Uh, if you go on Facebook at any time and just go on any Christian Bible site, you know, whatever it may be, reform site especially, you will see a ton of these fallacies used. And this is the biggest one. This is the one that I'm going to say uh, above all of these, even though I think all of these are immoral to use because you're distorting uh, what people are saying, and we'll talk about this more. Uh, you're demeaning people, and we'll talk about that more. Um, but it's ad hominem. Ad hominem means against the person. So instead of attacking the argument that's made, the person is attacked. The person is attacked either by motive. So, well, you just believe that because you're reformed. Uh, well, you just believe that because you're a Pado Baptist. But yeah, that's that's just the way that you you argue. It's like, well, that has nothing to do with the argument I made, though. If I'm making an actual argument, then deal with the argument. Don't just attack me because I have a motive or something. Well, you just want that to be true because of this or that in your life or whatever. And it's like, this is an ad hominem. Um, when you assign motive to people. 
Now, if you want to actually like counsel someone and get into their motivations and say, hey, are you, are you reasoning poorly? Like you, you refute the argument and then talk about the motive to why they, they want to believe that argument, even though it's not true, then fine. That, then you're kind of psychoanalyzing them and you're, you're trying to get them to understand why they keep going to this bad argument. But if you have not refuted the argument yet, do not attack the person by assigning motive. That is absolutely immoral because what you're actually saying is, is that um, I don't need to deal with the truth even though you're trying to speak truth to me. I can ignore that and I can attack you and say, you just believe that because of this or that or the other thing. Whether it's an atheist saying, you just believe that because you're a Christian, but if you weren't a Christian, you, you wouldn't make any of those arguments. And it's like, you know, especially when you're trying to present something more objective, like an argument from logic or what or whatnot. And an atheist is like, well, you just believe that because you're a Christian. And it's like, well, no, I, I mean, I, I may uh, be open to it because I'm a Christian. That may be true. Who knows what the motives may be. But at the end of the day, the argument is objective, and I'm making an objective argument. Now, deal with the argument. Don't try to attack me. Another way to uh, express an ad hominem to someone instead of you know attacking the person, instead of attacking the argument, is to uh, basically call them names. Um, and so this is the most common. Everyone, I think, who has ever entered into, frankly, any argument, but especially one where you're trying to present objective truth to someone, is going to get called arrogant if you're ex if you're actually expressing something that is objective. Um, and what people are often identifying there is that exclusive truth is making an authoritative claim over their lives. Now, the issue is is that they think that the authoritative claim being made is from you subjectively. And that's what's immoral about it because if you're trying to make an objective argument and they make it about you, then they're really trying to avoid the argument, dealing with the truth of the argument, and, it, and, and they're just trying to basically justify themselves by dismissing you. Because if I can say, well, you're just a jerk, you're just arrogant, you're just a know-it-all, uh, you're just, you know, you, you look funny, I don't like the way that you talk, blah, 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 like all that stuff, whatever it may be, I can't follow someone like you uh, because you wear a hat and you look like a hobo or whatever, whatever you want to say. Um, at the end of the day, that person has not attacked the argument, they've attacked you, and it is, in fact, immoral because it, it's a degradation of the person uh, that you're talking to. I would say this would be wrong if you were even talking to an unbeliever, but I absolutely think that you are in violation of Matthew 5, and you are essentially saying to your brother, Raka, you fool, uh, you're degrading him so that you don't have to actually deal with what's being said. It is a dehumanization of a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. It is 100% wicked. It is 100% sin, and people need to stop it immediately. Uh, I'll give you a good example of this on Facebook. Um, there's the, uh, the laughing emoji, right? So if you tell a joke, you can express that, you know, you thought the joke was funny, and you do, use the laughing emoji. That's what it's primarily for. But if you go on a site where there's, like, uh, Bible-believing Christians, especially Reformed people, uh, you're going to have that emoji used in order to mock and degrade someone who's trying to make a serious argument when the person hates it, they hate the argument, and they want to think it's stupid and the person's stupid for saying it, they're going to make that known with that laughing emoji. That's the whole thing. Essentially, you see that laughing emoji there, and that is a mockery of a person who represents Jesus Christ for trying to make a serious argument. They may be wrong. They may be overstating something. They may be doing, they may be committing logical fallacies themselves. Do not degrade another Christian by using that emoji in that way. The righteous do not sit in the seat of the mocker. So what seat are you sitting in? If you're sitting in the seat of a mocker, who are you? The righteous man? No, you're the wicked. So I don't care. Well, I believe in Jesus. I don't care if you believe in Jesus. Apparently you don't believe in him enough. D never, never degrade 
another Christian. Never dehumanize another Christian. Never attack another Christian because he or she has made an objective argument that you just don't like and you don't want to actually deal with the argument itself. If someone makes a biblical argument and you're not discussing the Bible, you're discussing that person, you're in sin and you need to repent. It is ridiculous for supposedly Christians to talk to one another in that manner, to degrade one another. I don't mean, I don't mean, don't speak harshly. I'm speaking harshly to you right now. I'm talking about degrading, mocking, attacking the person rather than the argument, assigning motive rather than dealing with the argument. This is all wicked. If a Bible argument has been made to you, a theological argument, an ethical argument, whatever it may be, has been made to you by a brother or sister in Christ, you better be addressing that argument and not on this other garbage. It shows an absolute immaturity and and evil to do this. If you're engaged in that, stop doing it. If you can't control yourself online, get offline. Do not do that, online or otherwise. You're going to be held accountable for other, uh, either one. It's not like uh, online is some sort of free world where you get to go ahead and sin against Christians because it doesn't really matter because they can't see you and blah, blah, blah. You would never in person, when someone tries to make a, a serious argument to you, um, even if, again, even if they're overstating, even if they're a little bit too dogmatic, uh, young Christians tend to be. Uh, overly dogmatic about things that they don't quite understand yet. Um, I think mature Christians tend to be dogmatic. Maybe they understand them a little bit more. But you would never, in real person, in real life, in front of the person, when they offered you that argument, say, ha, 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 dummy. You would never do that. But that is what is implied when you use those emojis. That's what it is implied when you say, that's laughable. I had a guy say that to me last night. He was like, oh, that's laughable. And it's like, you haven't even heard my argument yet. I just gave you the conclusion. I'll often, this is the way that I talk. I will often give a conclusion. And if anyone's going to be teachable, I'll give them the argument. You, you can just save a lot of time by weeding out the unteachable, by making the conclusion first and seeing how they react. If you get a bunch of snarkiness and demeaning and mockery and personal attacks and all of that sort of thing, just don't even bother. I do not teach unteachable people. If they're not open to argument, I have no desire that they ever even hear the argument. Let them see, but not see. Let them hear, but not hear. Uh, I'm not interested in that. I don't think the Holy Spirit is with that person, at least not at that time. And so I'm not interested in teaching them. And neither should you be. Now, part of this ad hominem and this sort of subjectivism comes from the fact that people think that arguments, in fact, are being derived subjectively. Because down deep, we are brainwashed to believe that even though God is communicated in the Bible, um, he's not communicated sufficiently. So even though the Bible is true, we have to somehow figure out for ourselves what it says, and we can only do that subjectively through our personal experience, through our personal relationship, through prayer, through these other spiritual means, because, well, the Bible's a spiritual book, right? Um, I would appeal to you that actually the Bible's a very human book in regard to the language being used, and therefore God can communicate to us. If God were to use some sort of like, spiritual, and God doesn't even have a language, so as some sort of spiritual communication that was so far above us that we could only get it through like some sort of nebulous uh, feeling or intuition or whatever it may be, then the Bible, again, is worthless because it's just got words in the way. Obviously, God uses humans and their language and their culture and everything else as a part of the means through which he communicates to us because it's understandable. Because we're humans too. We may not be those humans who know Hebrew and are in an ancient Near Eastern culture or who know Greek or in a Greco-Roman culture, but we are human enough to be able to study those humans, try to figure out their language and all of that, and then interpret for our culture and for our day. 
And so as humans, we understand that God is using the logic of language that's human. And therefore, it's not subjective. Now, you could say that language is subjective and how it's derived and all that. But what I mean is, is that once it's understood what someone is attempting to communicate, it becomes objective. Now we know this person intends to communicate A and not B. Therefore, saying A is objective truth and B is not. So all of these sort of fallacies that appeal to the person, it's like it's trying to attack the person because down deep we actually feel like, well, it's you making the argument, not the Bible. It's you making the argument, not God. And in reality, we need to deal with the argument because most of the time, if you get someone who's being honest and they're bringing out exegesis and they're making logical arguments, they are in fact making the argument that this is God, not me. Now, if someone approaches you to be like, well, I think this personally, uh, you know, I don't have objective things, but I think everybody should follow me because yeah, I'm just so great and so smart and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, then you can maybe attack the person and be like, well, I don't think you're that great and that smart, therefore we shouldn't follow you. That would be probably legitimate, but I don't know anyone who argues that way. Usually it's an argument from scripture and therefore we need to deal with the argument from scripture and not attack the person. I often say to people, when people give me an ad hominem in an argument, I, I immediately, and I, I, at this point I will point out to them uh, in a very sharp way by saying, I, I appreciate you yielding. I, I, I appreciate you admitting that you've lost the argument. As soon as someone uses a logical fallacy, especially something like ad hominem, which is pretty easy to see, because you can ask the question, are we talking about the argument right now or me? I mean, that's all you have to do. The, the person making the ad hominem can ask that question themselves. Am I talking about the argument this guy or this girl made, or am I talking about the guy or girl? And you can spot it right away. And so as soon as someone does that, I'm like, thanks for conceding the argument. I appreciate it. Because what it actually says is that you don't have an argument, but you still don't like the conclusion so you need to somehow justify holding to your idea that has been proven wrong and you can't do it by attacking the argument because you're not able. So the only thing that's going to make you feel better is unleashing on the person. And that again, my friend, is why it is immoral. You are sinning and degrading a person simply because you don't want to deal with something that could be true. Let's say it's false, but you don't know because you're not dealing with the argument in any sort of responsible, honest, logical, biblical way. Again, this is a moral imperative for God's people. This has just been lost on the American church. I am tired of people making arguments and suddenly it's, well, that's because you're this and, well, that's because of that. And we, well, you're just, well, you just think you know everything. I, I'm so sick of that. Let's talk about the subjects that we're debating. That's how iron sharpens iron. The reason why I said you're wasting your time when you use these logical fallacies and you're wasting other people's time and you're wasting God's time is because no one is being sharpened by simply logical fallacies. No one is being sharpened by someone who's not dealing with the argument. Um, it's not communication. It's not meaningful conversation. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Okay, a simple wrong would have done just fine, but... So it's meaningless. And all you're doing is showing a lack of character in arguing that way. Immediately, what you have shown everyone, everyone who actually, like, I'm sure everyone on your side of the aisle will be like, oh, good job, because, you know, they, whatever, they're biased toward it, and they don't care if you use logic or not, and, you know, it's sort of like the Democrats or the Republicans, as long as you get your shots in and all that sort of thing. But anyone who understands logical interpretation and is looking for the truth is going to be like, this was a worthless conversation. Like, I, I got to tell you, half the debates I see on YouTube 
I want to contact these guys to say, why did you post this? Because a lot of them are against like laymen. So they'll have like people against laymen or these guys are just so illogical. Um, you know, there, there's that debate between like James White, Jeff Durbin and those atheists and all, all the atheist does is rant. And I realize it's posted to show the irrationality of atheists. Like I get that, but ultimately did, did, did it really help anyone uh, to see that debate? I mean, is, is it, did, did anyone actually think in that debate um, in terms of like watch it and say, oh yeah, this was, this was very thought provoking. It's like, no, it might've been thought provoking on the side of like uh, Durbin and White, but it's not very thought provoking on the other side. And even then, then you're not actually getting like maybe the most intellectual debate between an atheist. Like I wanna know what's, what's the atheist's best argument? That's what I want to know. Um, so at the end of the day, I don't walk away and wonder, man, I guess I really didn't really hear the atheist side. I feel like I don't even know what they believe or what their arguments are because this guy was so emotional and all that sort of thing. And so my point is, is that, look, these, these are worthless conversations. They don't do anything but display poor character in the people that use them. So we as Christians need to make sure that we're not using them and we certainly don't want to display these things as like examples that, hey, please follow them. Again, I understand why they posted it uh, to show the ir irrationality, but I don't, but, but I almost feel like it's co become commonplace, uh, not just with them, but other people to post debates between people who are like laity. They're clearly not scholars in any way. Like, give me scholars debating. I don't want just ignorance passed back and forth because you're just going to get a lot of these logical fallacies because people are not taught this anymore. They're not taught logical fallacies. They're not taught how to reason. They're not, half these people with the Bible aren't taught, taught how to exegete correctly. And so ultimately, like, what do you end up with but basically um, bad examples in argumentation? Um, I, I'd rather just watch a bunch of good examples, even if I don't agree with the conclusions, good examples of people debating one another, um, you know, and just in a more congenial, honest way, looking at arguments and not trying to attack one another. Well, uh, another argument is... Um, that of the genetic fallacy. The genetic fallacy is kind of like an ad hominem. Uh, it's kind of attacking the person, but what it's really doing is it's attacking the argument by what person it's from or what school of thought may have like first thought it up or something. Um, and so ultimately it's going to be like uh, something like, so it, it'd be like an example, like um, uh, liberal scholars believe that Daniel was written in the second century. Therefore, everyone who believes Daniel's written in the second century is a liberal. Um, that sort of genetic fallacy. Well, you just believe that. That's that. You got that from liberalism, and and that's that can only come from liberalism. And then, like uh, another fallacy called a false dichotomy is created, to where only liberalism could have concluded this. Um, when in reality, that's not true at all. Uh, I, I hold the Daniels in the second century and yet uh, written in the second century, and yet I do not believe uh, what liberals believe. And it doesn't come from any sort of like uh, anti supernaturalism. I absolutely believe in God's supernaturalism and all of that. And so it's this, this sort of genetic fallacy that's created that this bad idea was by this person, um, and. Um, and, and this idea is related to that person believing this idea, and therefore it's wrong. And what I would say instead is that, well, you have to first prove that it's a bad idea, that it's actually false. And once you do that, then you can go back and say, hey, it's related to this and that or the other thing, and this is how it develops historically. But that still has nothing to do with whether it's a good or bad argument. Well, another one is the appeal to common belief or what's called an ad populum. And that is, is that when you make an argument, instead, again, of dealing with your argument, people say, well, who else believes this? Um, who, 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 you know, m most people don't believe that. Almost no one believes it. I mean, this is just, this is a small belief. It's idiosyncratic. Um, and therefore, it's not true. And it's kind of like, well, that's, that, again, doesn't follow. You, you can 
believe that actually something is true against the masses and the masses are wrong. In fact, I have said numerous times that the masses are usually wrong. Uh, the, if you appeal to the majority, this is also called an appeal to, I think, democracy or something. It has different names. But uh, it's used a lot um, because people feel security in numbers, right? So, um, well, you know, at one time, homosexuality was thought as a bad thing by the masses. And therefore, well, you appeal to the masses. I mean, nobody thinks it's right. And therefore, it's probably wrong. Now the majority are like, well, it's most people think it's perfectly fine, and so what well, probably is. And it's like, well, how did it change? Like, what, what do you mean? Like, if it was wrong here, but it's okay here, what happened? Like, what argument was made? And of course, there wasn't an argument made other than, you know, you have got the, the one of the sexual revolution, but, but ultimately it was simply that, well, everybody thinks it's okay now versus everybody thought it was bad back then, and therefore it was bad back then, and it's okay now. And you have these kind of... Uh, situational ethics going on. Um, another one is like, well, who in church history believes something? Because that's more that's the more Christian view, right? Now, this one can have validity to it because if we do believe the Holy Spirit is guiding the church, but the only way to verify that is to look at two things. One, because we believe in sola scriptura, that gets to override even the church. Um, but two, we believe at least in the essentials. And that's what we see in church history, the essentials, not these other things. There's a variety of opinion on a lot of things, but the essentials seem to be uniform. Um, that I would say the spirit has guided them. And so I think that is an important question, which is why I always tell laymen, look, if you're looking for a church, if you're looking for someone who's solid, um, look at the essentials. That is the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, uh, doctrine of salvation, and, um, and what they believe about sexuality. And those things will guide you as to whether you're in the historic Christian church. But everything else, you're not going to be able to tell. Like there are different views on baptism. There are different views on eschatology. There are different views on polity. There's, I mean, you just have a variety of views on, on a ton of different things. And so the idea that like, well, everybody believed the same thing in church history, that, that's just not true. But it is, it is true when you're talking about essentials, and so I think it's, it's valid there. It's not, it's not valid in other things. Like if you're looking at, for a specific biblical interpretation of a passage, one, not only do you have a diversity of opinion, you also don't have a lot of exegesis going on. So you might have one guy interpret a passage a particular way, and everybody just kind of follows that because no one's really like drawing out from Hebrew and syntax and uh, backgrounds, and uh, like they're not doing that. Most... Biblical interpretation that we get in church history is often taken from teachers who are teaching the congregation sermons. They're not writing commentaries. Even their commentaries are really sermons that they're giving. And their sermons are highly devotional. Um, whether you're talking about church fathers all the way through the reformers to the Puritans, it's very rare that people are exegeting. And even when they are, they're not necessarily doing it well. Now, does that mean that the Spirit has not guided them in, into the truth of the essentials? No, he has. Um, but when it comes to individual passages, just be careful with that because that's not really going to help you. In the end, we really do need to believe in sola scriptura and therefore go back to the Bible and draw out from it what is it actually saying and not rely on church history in that regard. Church history, once we've done that, we can, that can kind of confirm our exegesis by saying, okay, I've exegeted this, I've looked at the other arguments, I've excluded these, and I've objectively decided, uh, or I've, uh, I've drawn out the objective evidence that this, is, this should be concluded a particular way. And then I look to church history and they also conclude that. Then it's like, oh, great, wow, that's amazing how the spirit works. Um, but you want to first appeal to the Bible and draw it out from there. Uh, another one is the no true Scotsman fallacy. The no true Scotsman fallacy is one where, you know, it's the, the classic example is that, you know, no true Scotsman would eat like porridge with butter or something. And, um, and then you point out a Scotsman who eats his porridge with butter and they say, well, that's not a true Scotsman. And you'll see this if you ever debate Roman Catholics on anything. 
uh, they'll be like, well, well, the fathers didn't believe this idea. And then you point out a father who believes in something like justification by faith or whatever alone. Um, and then they'll be like, well, he's not really a, an actual father. He's not recognized by the church as such. And it's like, oh, okay, so he's not a true father because he doesn't back your opinion. And you'll see this in the Eastern church as well. If you ever uh, debate anything with Eastern Orthodox, um, it, it's the same thing. It's like, you, if you quote them a Western father, forget it. Well, he's, he's not a real father of the church. It's like, okay. Um, you know, no reformed person would ever believe such and such. And then you point out a reformed person who believes it, and you're like, well, they're not a real reformed person. It's like, okay. Another one is the uh, slippery slope argument. And I would tie this in maybe to a non sequitur. Non sequitur means that it does not follow. And so I, I, I'll get this a lot, right? If I, if I say something about the image of God and I say not everybody's the image of God um, because the image of God is functional, not ontological, and that whole argument that many of you have heard already. Um, it, I'll get, sometimes you'll get back things like, well, that means we could just kill anyone. And it's like, no, it actually doesn't. Uh, as I've said before, like if I saw a dog being beaten on the street, I would try to save the dog and I wouldn't beat the dog and kill it because the dog's not the image, but because I am. I'm supposed to protect uh, creation and protect the creatures. And that includes even people who have not yet become the image of God. They've not yet been restored to the image of God. I'm still to protect even the innocent in that regard. Same thing happens when I make the argument about the neighbor, right? Like, oh, uh, you, you know, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't give the church's money to the neighbor. Your, your money is sacred. It goes to the, uh, the people of God. And it's like, well, I mean, if everybody's not our neighbor, then uh, that means we could just like, you know, eat them or something. And it's like, no, it really does not. Uh, we are meant to save people. And so we're looking to save, not destroy anyone. And so the argument that you wouldn't eat them uh, comes from other things. It, there, there are other things in the Bible and Christianity that would say, absolutely not. You do what is good and right in the eyes of God, and you try to protect the innocent, whether they're believers or not, and you want to try to save as many as you can. That is our job as the image of God. And so those are slippery slope arguments that, well, if you teach this, this horrible thing will affect. People will start believing this or doing this, and that's bad. And since that's bad, then your argument must be wrong. Well, no, it doesn't. Even if you were to find something that you think is a negative effect, like if you teach homosexuality is wrong, they're going to commit suicide. It still doesn't mean that homosexuality is fine. It still doesn't mean that my argument that homosexuality is wrong is bad, is false simply because they, they're, it might result in conclusions or, or bad things that we don't want. Um, same thing with non sequiturs, though, is that a lot of things don't follow. Just because you teach that certain things are immoral does not mean they'll lead to bad things. In the context of teaching other things, again, we're trying to save those people. I would argue that homosexuality, so homosexuality sort of just deteriorates the mind, that uh, gender confusion is a deterioration of the mind, and that ultimately that's what leads to suicide, not anything of saying, hey, uh, God's called you away from that. Repent of that. He, he's, he, he'll restore you through Jesus Christ who's died, uh, that he might actually um, forgive us of our sins. So I don't think preaching the gospel and preaching the law is somehow uh, uh, wicked to do because of slippery slopes and because of non sequiturs. Well, there, there's a lot of fallacies. Again, I could go over. There are a lot of important ones that I think are used in the church, but I'm just going to mention one last one, and that is a straw man fallacy. Uh, many of you know what a straw man is. Uh, another way of saying it is caricaturing a, an argument. What, it, it, what, what that ultimately means is that you're building an argument of someone's argument that isn't actually their argument. It kind of sounds like it a little bit. Some of the words are put in there, but it's not quite the way that they would argue. 
Um, and, and to the point of even refuting it because it's easier to refute it. That's why it's called a straw man, because it's easier to knock over a straw man than it is a real man. It's easier to refute a false argument that you made up in your head than your opponent's argument that actually is much stronger than the one that you wanted to knock down. And in fact, it's often done because people can't knock the actual argument down. Um, a lot of this stems from the fact that if you hear the conclusion of an argument that you don't like or you think is absurd, you will start to form a caricature of the argument in your mind to justify your not believing that thing that you think is ridiculous, that thing that you think is absurd, that thing that you just think is false. Um, and you do it, it's, it really is a way of kind of self-comforting. Uh, we all have done this, I think, in the past. It, again, it really is immoral, though, because what you're ultimately doing is you're actually not treating the person with respect. You're taking them out of context and distorting their words. Imagine, if, again, if we were having a conversation one-on-one -on -one and you were trying to ask me to pass the salt. And I was like, oh, I'm salt of the earth. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and I just kind of ignored you. And then I didn't pass the salt to you. And then you were like, oh, can you, know, can you please pass the salt? And it's like, pass what? You're going to pass away uh, waiting for the salt? <laughs> and I just didn't pass it. And I kept distorting your words. I made everybody laugh around me, and it was a big joke. Really, I'm making you the butt of the joke. Um, by not respecting your argument, by presenting it accurately in the way that you would have it presented, I'm not respecting you. And again, you're doing this to another Christian. It is immoral. I realize we all do this. We all need to stop doing it. It's wrong. It's wrong. I don't know how you would ever think that it was okay. And we, we, we fall into these traps. And then what we end up doing is we end up creating a community that where no one can communicate to one another in any sort of honest way that's different than what someone else believes and so we end up not growing people because they don't want to ask questions because we're just caricaturing uh, all of their uh, arguments. Or we don't want to talk to them because they're just straw manning us. And we get to where we're just back to, hey, how's the weather? Great. How's Ma doing? Okay, great. That's fantastic. Uh, well, ni nice blue sky today. Hey, want some tea? I mean, it's just all this superficial nonsense because no one wants to talk to one another because they're just going to get made fun of or demeaned in some way because you bring up an argument for a conclusion that people don't like. So they don't want to deal with the argument. Our practice should be that I try my hardest to present an argument that I don't agree with but because you're saying it, not because I respect the argument, but because I respect and love you, I'm going to try my hardest to really understand what you're saying because that's what you do to people you love. You don't do it to people you hate. You don't listen to them. Look at what the news media did. I, I, this is a great example. Not that Trump's a believer. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. I don't know. But the point is, is look what they did to Trump. Why did they do it to him? Because they hate his guts. Why are they so nice to Biden? Because they love him. You will listen and really try hard to listen to people that you love. When a child comes to you, you're trying to understand what he's saying. You're not being a jerk to him and twisting his words and dismissing him and not listening to what he's saying and just ignoring him. You're not doing that. Because you care for him. If we care for one another... We're going to try really hard to listen to what we're saying and to examine, hey, are you making an objective argument? What is the objective argument that you're making? And really try to deal with it biblically and logically. Everything else is immoral. Everything else is immoral. If you are not doing that, you are in sin. Because that is love. And anything else is hatred. And you have no right to treat another Christian that way. So I, I, I am going to be, I'm going to admit for myself that I have done this and I absolutely repent. And I pray that you repent of it as well. It is evil. And we're not just doing it to one another. We represent Christ to one another. We're doing it to Christ, whom we say we serve. 
let it not be that we ever justify or think that we can continue to do this. So let's try to present one another's arguments clearly, concisely, um, coherently, in a way that we would want to express uh, someone to express our ideas in a very honest way. When I hear my arguments being made to other people and I hear them back and they're made by people who don't agree with me, I'm like, I don't believe that either. I would never present it that way. That's being presented as a cartoon of what I believe. That's not the argument I make. The actual arguments I make for a lot of these things would put you in a corner to where you wouldn't be able to get out of them. That's why I believe them, because I have to, because logic in the Bible forces me to, not because I love the martyrdom of believing them. And yet when I hear these ridiculous arguments back that supposedly are what I argued, I'm just like, people are doing wrong to me. And it's like, there's nothing you can do about that except for try to teach the community better. But ultimately for myself, like, I don't want to do that to people. And I know that I probably have. And so I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do it online. I don't want to do it in our church meetings. I don't want to do it when I'm talking to anyone about anybody else's position. I want to understand what is your position. I want to display it in the best possible light that I can. Because if I can't knock it down in its best possible light with its best possible arguments, then I need to submit to one of two things. Either that it's a legitimate argument and I cannot dismiss it, or that it's actually the true interpretation of scripture and I need to submit to it. Until I refute that argument, not with any of these, this garbage, not any of these logical fallacies, until I actually refute an argument being made to me from the Bible, it is the Bible to me. It is God's voice to me until I can refute it. And what, what I mean by that, again, is either I can refute from the scripture and logic what you're saying, that that's not the right interpretation, or I can establish that an alternate interpretation is possible out of the passage using both exegesis and logic. If I can't do one of those two things, then I am actually in rebellion against God because I've not actually dismissed, I've not actually uh, come to the point where I know it's not God. And now I'm calling it stupid and now I'm calling it ridiculous and I'm not going to listen to it and it's dumb and I, how absurd and blah, blah, blah. And I'm actually doing that against God. It's actually an act of rebellion. What if I come to someone who believes in universalism or inclusivism and I say to them, and I have done this many times and I think many of you have done this. I say to them, um, Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father there is no other way of salvation, and you must come via faith in the spoken gospel, which is the call. Therefore, inclusivism cannot be true, and universalism cannot be true, based upon the exegesis of the gospel of John, not only where Christ says that he is the exclusive mediator between God and man, but also throughout the gospel that displays him as such. And, uh, and then, of course, I'd make that argument as I have made before. Uh, through the gospel. And I make that argument and someone says to me, um, well, I don't, I, I, I don't personally believe that. And that's it. That's the, that's the shutdown of the, the, I've given them all this time and energy that I put into making this objective argument. What did they just do to me? They gave me a subjective, well, I don't believe that. But I'm making the argument as to why you should believe it based upon the objective word of God. I didn't say, hey, I believe that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man, and you should believe it too. I didn't say that. I said, God said it, Christ said it in the Gospel of John. Here are the arguments, da 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 da. You cannot then counter mine by saying, I don't believe it. I don't believe it as an act of rebellion against God because I just gave you an objective argument that God has said thus and you've said, I, I refuse to believe what God has said. And I refuse, refuse to believe that God has said it, even though I just gave you an objective argument that he did. And so again, 
This is very important because we're very, the, the flesh is slippery. It's your worst enemy. It's going to think that you got out of an argument simply because you're like, well, I don't believe that. Who cares? Who cares what you believe? That, or, then, then we need to start talking about whether or not you believe what God says. And of course, everyone's going to be like, oh yeah, of course, I believe what God says. Okay, well, my argument was just based on the fact that God said it, not me. So why don't you believe it? You can't simply rebut an argument with a subject, an objective argument with just some subjective uh, statement that you don't believe it. That's just an act of rebellion then. And so that's, I want to communicate to you. I, I know this is probably hard. You've probably never heard this before. And so I'm not trying to just like shock you with it, but I do want you to think about it that ultimately until you can refute someone biblically, exegetically and logically that is the word of, you know, when they're making an argument from scripture, that is the word of God to you. Until you can refute it, either refute their argument that that's not a correct uh, interpretation of that passage. You can't merely say, well, I don't believe that's not a correct interpretation of the passage. Well, yeah, again, you're subjectively trying to refute objective material, objective arguments. And so what you need to do instead is to say, um, okay, let, let's look at the gospel of John then. I'll show you, let, let, let's you know, look at the exegesis and, and here are my exegetical arguments for why that's not true and da, 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 and all that sort of thing. That's what you need to do, argue the passage. But until you do that, until you can objectively say, hey, look, at uh, this, that's not what that verse is really saying. Here's the context here and let me exegete that and therefore it refutes your position. Or here's the context here. Let me exegete that and see you can get either interpretation from it. So yours is not, isn't binding on me as the word of God because this other one might be. Until you can do that, then when you simply rebut something with, I don't believe that, or I think that's absurd, or I don't like that, or any of these logical fallacies, who else believes that? Uh, uh, well, you know, th that's what liberals believe, or, you know, whatever it may be. Ultimately, that is the word of God to you until you actually can establish your own opinion from the text, and logically from the text, exegetically from the text that we've been, as we've been establishing. So I hope that that's helpful. I, you know, again, we could do a million of these, but I, I really, you can tell I'm kind of worked up about it because I, I want it to stop. I, I just feel like, look, you know, being sick, I watch a lot of Christians interact. I, I watch them on YouTube. I watch them on Facebook. Um, I see how they're interacting. I see how the interactions are going in the church. Often we do a little bit better than I think, uh, people on Facebook and, uh, YouTube often do, but man, it's a lot. It's a lot of logical fallacies. It's a lot of, lot of personal attacks in place of arguments. It's a lot of distorting of people's arguments. It's just dishonest. And look, we're all going to be confused about what people are arguing, right? That's not an issue. Like if, if you're just, you're trying to understand someone and you don't, that's not really immoral. What I'm really talking about is if you don't really, uh, one, want to understand someone because you don't like it, so you don't put any effort or work into understanding it, that's immoral. Um, or you, the, what's even worse than that is if you do understand it, but because you hate it so much, you distort it with a logical fallacy or attacking a person or whatever, a signing motive or the genetic fallacy or whatever it may be, um, that's immoral. Those things are sin because you're actually trying, you're actually degrading the person making the argument and oh, you might be find yourself actually blaspheming God, uh, degrading God, mocking God himself through his people. That is not what you, where you want to be. So let's be loving toward one, uh, one another, to be loving toward one another as we look at one another's arguments. Let's be loving toward one another when we evaluate one another's arguments, uh, not being irrational, not being emotional, because that's going to make us use a lot of really bad fallacies, and we're going to end up sinning against one another. I guarantee it. it happens every time. Divorce yourself from this truth um, divorce yourself from the argumentation. Approach it as you did as a new believer, not knowing what is true, but in complete submission to God, just wanting to know what's true. 
not wanting to justify yourself, not wanting to hold on to practices, even though God's saying, give them up, not wanting to hold on to beliefs, even though God's saying to give them up. When you were a new believer, you're willing to actually put that all on the table. Put it all on the table again. When someone brings you a biblical argument, when someone brings you a theological or ethical argument, put it all on the table again and say, okay, am I really doing what God wants me to do? Have I said what God wants me to say? Have I believed what God wants me to believe? Because whatever he wants, that's what I want. My life is his. I surrender. And so I surrender everything to him, and I may have to end up holding things that everyone else thinks are absurd. But I have come to believe they are the teaching of the word of God, and therefore the teaching of God, and I must bow down to them, and I must call others to bow down to them. That's where we need to be. And we need to do so in love, in patience with one another, patience with one another's arguments, trying to understand the arguments, patience with one another and trying to get people to understand our arguments when they may not. Um, Speaking well to one another and not poorly to one another. We never want to degrade one another. Give honor to one another. You are not giving honor to people by distorting their arguments. You're not giving honor to people by attacking them instead of their arguments. Let us give honor to one another in love and we'll do just fine in our conversations. We'll foster a community that can actually sharpen one another and grow together because we're willing to lay it out on the table, not take offense, not get emotional about it, not attack one another, but actually look at what's being argued from the Bible logically and come to the truth. I think the, that God will honor that. I think the Holy Spirit will guide us through that, but he's not going to guide us through the chaos of logical fallacies. I guarantee that. Well, um, I hope this was helpful. Again, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.